I was really wanted to just prompt uh, Sarah just to uh, describe again um, a process she went through with children in uh, primary school, um, where she simply asked them, uh, "Who's in charge?" Um, and and this was uh, this was absolutely fascinating. Um, so I, I really want to just uh, hand over to Sarah for this one. Yeah, it's picking up on part of your talk around what is and isn't going on in schools and how uh, the knowledge isn't coming through for children to, to understand what's clearly going on. And over the years, I've done quite a bit of um, sharing in, in schools with some very young children. And mm. like you said, I, um, I'd asked them this question. And some of them would be like age five or seven or nine. Who, who's so, in charge of you? And they'd look around and go, <laughs> absolutely, totally disorientated by my question. And oh. then they'd almost look frightened by it. Who's in charge of me? And then they, their little minds would jump around going, my mum, my dad, yeah. Um, yeah. the head teacher. And I just shake my head. Have another thing. You. They had literally no idea. And when I'd say things to them like, um, "What about when it goes wrong? You know, if you find you're in an argument with one of your friends, or you know, who 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 could go first to try and help bring it bring it back so you'd be friends again?" My mom, <laughs> my dad teacher is there anyone else is there anyone else who's there who could do something about this and sometimes someone would a little voice would pipe up and go mm -hmm. and it was like it was like an enormous turnaround for them they'd never heard of such an idea that there was something they could do to go first and then I uh -huh. said, imagine what that would be like then if you got in first and then your mom, dad, teacher, head teacher, me, anyone doesn't have to tell you off. They thought this was incredible. They'd never heard anything like it. And it was, um, I found the whole thing though, really quite disconcerting, like, exactly like your, your, you were writing because this is in school after school. I mean, I haven't taught in that many schools, but I've taught in enough places to see that this is a theme and across all age groups in schools. And mm -hmm. they obviously do their pastoral care and their, they do learning about values and things, but they haven't got any idea of this fundamental insight that there is something they can do to change experience. And there is something they can do to bring about peace for themselves and for their friends and their family. They've no idea about it. So it's a very, um, it's, a, it, it's a sign of our times and maybe it's a sign of all times and just how, how important and practical the, what you're, you're sharing is. It's, it's, it's really, um, and, and, the, and the Buddhist teaching, it's, 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 it's setting an essential framework to, to bring back balance. One hopes so. <laughs> one has to hope. Yeah, one has to hope so. <laughs> because the West is kind of hooked into this idea of the victim right now. And many uh, people will end up the victim in um, psychoanalyst with psychoanalysis or with psychology and so Buddhism doesn't accept the victim. That's why I like it so much. You cannot be a victim and be really understanding Buddhism because Buddhism is telling you, hey, I'm breaking the news to you. Are you ready? Nothing ever happened to you. Everything is happening from you. And if you're depressed at all and you don't like life, what I want you to do is this, go out to an art store and buy one sheet of white paper and put it on the wall. 
Like you can even put it in a frame and put it on the wall where you're going to see it every morning. And that is your blank canvas. You are going to paint a picture every day. And at nighttime, while you sleep, the devas or the angels, whoever you want to say, they come and erase it, and it's white again in the morning. And your picture is going to end up with pinks and oranges and purples and chartreuse greens and just wonderful stuff and violets and flowers and everything. But if it ends up with dark brown and black and gray and all this stuff on there on the canvas, just remember, you are in charge of painting your day. You are in charge of creating your life to live day by day. And when you finish that day, you can remember it by putting it in a scrapbook, okay? You can keep it in a scrapbook in your mind and look at it again if you want to, but don't be putting it in the trunk of the car that you're driving through life, like this little car is driving along through life, and this is your little car. Don't you be packing in the trunk of this car everything that goes wrong. Because if you do, it won't be able to go on the road, it's going to fall off. It's going to be too heavy to keep going on track. But this little car is your present time. I don't care how old you are. I don't care. Little kids love this. They think it's great. <laughs> and older people will fight you and say, no, that happened to me. Well, sure, it happened to you. It happened to me. It happened to them. It happened to them. Okay? But it happened in the past. And the energy of everything in the past is gone. It's used up, whatever that event is, whoever died, whatever mudslide came and took away the village, whether would the flood happen, I don't care, the tsunami, what it was, it's over. And that, that you know what they told me about that tsunami? <laughs> I was in New York and the, I was crying because all those people were hurt and people were dying all over the place. And we're packing the trucks at the temple with crutches and all the stuff for the hospital stuff to be sent on the ship over there and everything. And the man comes in the temple. He walks up to me. He says, What's, why are you so upset? I said, I'm upset because of the tsunami. And he said, well, we don't get upset about that now. <laughs> we have to pack the truck. And I said, well, I'm packing the truck. I'm packing the truck, but I'm crying. I'm, my heart is hurting. He said, well, don't tell, tell your heart not to hurt now. And I said, how do you do that? He said, well, we all know. Well, what do you mean you know? And he said, it was a tsunami. It was a wave and the wave came. And the wave did what waves do, and the wave is gone. Now it's time to clean up. And he gave me a ginger candy and a, and a tissue, and he said, now it's time to pack the truck. <laughs> now you have to clean up. That's it. And that's what they understand in Asia. That's what they understand here, because they've lived with this kind of thing happening, you know? That's what you have to do. I remember in China once there was an earthquake. They didn't tell people what happened till a couple months later. They didn't want to admit 600,000 people died in an earthquake in the middle of China. This was back in 1960s. The whole city, shake, shake, shake. There it is, it's gone. Then what are you gonna do? They didn't tell anybody. That was a long time ago, but that I was in high school when that happened. It tells you again, I'm 71, so that was a long time ago. Okay. But this thing about the past and the future, you have to get it into your mind. You know, this is the past, this is the future, and you're moving along like this in the present time capsule. And it has a trunk, if it has a trunk, don't put anything in the trunk. When something happens, how do you know what's happening? How is it shaped? It, it has a beginning, 
It has a middle and it has an end. And when that's done, the next thing has a beginning, has a middle and an end. See, that's how you know. Don't you be picking up those things behind you and putting them in a trunk and carrying them with you because you're not going to be able to sleep or eat or get rid of an ulcer or have a tumor because of it or cancer. All those things are caused by the heaviness and the weight of carrying that stuff around. And if you're worried a lot about it and you're living by yourself, well, then figure out how to get on the phone and cheer somebody up. I don't care who it is. You think you're depressed? Find somebody who lost their foot or lost a leg or doesn't have legs. You need to tune into Nick with no arms and legs. Then he'll tell you how that's done. He, no arms and legs. He has no arms and legs. He was born without any arms and legs. And I thought to myself, how dare I get upset when I have a cast on my foot? <laughs> you know, I broke my ankle and I had a cast on my foot. That's when somebody introduced me to Nick with no arms and legs. He has one foot down at the bottom that he can jump up on a chair and jump onto a ping pong table. He can stand there and cheer you up so much you won't believe it. You will laugh, you will cry, and you will understand more than you ever understood what life is all about. And your problems and my problems are just nothing compared to what this guy was born with. Nothing, nothing. We cannot even match. Our problems can't even come close to the edge of what he had to deal with. And he almost died. He almost killed himself when he got, a, you know, teenage years. And he was in his 20s, I think. And then he came out of it. He realized he had a gift. And you know how he came out of it that you can't guess. He started helping other people. And there's a secret about loving kindness, you know, and about karuna compassion and loving kindness you can't think any ill will towards anybody and when you're into compassion helping other people you cannot have any thoughts of cruelty come up in your mind and when you start having you know getting involved in the joy of other people other people's joy you start to have so much joy when they succeed, that you don't have any discontent anymore. And you think, what happened? What happened to my discontent? I was miserable. He left, she left, they left, the house is gone, the, the car fell in the river, the cow died, the chickens are all gone, the, the, somebody ate them. <laughs> You know, it goes on and on and on. You know, we, we left the mountain one time. I'll never forget. We left one guy up on the mountain and all he had to do, he could stay up there in that cabin and all he had to do was feed the chickens once a day. That's all he had to do. We are unpacking and like, how's it going? And he says, Oh my gosh, two of the chickens are died. Two of the chickens died. Well, he's down to eight chickens. He just went along. The next night we're driving along. We said, don't worry about it. You still have eight chickens. And we're driving along the next night, a, you know, a few hundred miles more down the road. We're doing another retreat. And then we call him up and, and I say, so how's it going? Oh, two more chickens died. Two more chickens are gone. He's down to six. And by the time, by the time we crossed the country from New York to California, no more chickens. <laughs> and they couldn't figure out who was eating the chickens. They built the chicken coop and they had the wire and they had the door and all they could see inside was the blood and a few pieces of the chicken every day this happened. It was just awful. Yeah, you just see. So you see how lucky you are, you weren't the chicken. <laughs> You're a human being, you know? You have to look at the blessings here. How can you say being a human being is good? I feel terrible. 
okay. What do you mean it's okay? So say a Nietzsche and start again, because <laughs> you're not, everything is changing all the time. So if you lean in the direction of a little bit of laughter and, a, and give some smiles away to some people down at the store and start smiling at people on the street, all of a sudden, you're going to find out something, <laughs> you know? All of a sudden, you're going to find out you don't have to stay in the funk. You fell in a funk. We call it a funk, an F-U-N-K. <laughs> funk. We fell into the funk. It's like a depression that it's driving you crazy and why are you staying there you have the power to come out nobody else is going to come throw you a rope you want me to i'll try but this thing isn't very long i mean it's only a phone cord i mean i can throw it but you're not going to be able to reach it you see what i'm saying you have the power to produce your experience every day of your life we're back to that so now I know you have the power. Are you going to do it? That's the big question. Are you going to do it? And when you get stuck, are you, what are you going to do? I mean, I have a stick here. I can, you got stuck again, stuck again, stuck again. I can beat myself up, beat myself up. Or I can just say, okay, that's done. Now we go to the next thing and we try to finish that. You have to keep going. You're in charge. You're, you're steering the boat. And it's always fun, I think, that you don't know where it's going. I mean, some people get upset about that. Yeah, you. Just going to pick up on something you said, that you're in charge of your experience. Um, the invitation is sometimes for that experience to come from outside. So are we more talking about here uh, being in charge of our response to the outside and therefore our internal experience rather than the external experience what's the beginning mind is the forerunner of all states mind mm -hmm. made are they if you're falling down it started here uh, and then yes. it went down so if something comes up and brings you up it started here and you you, you went up you see yep. Yep. So the place, yep. that's why I'm saying you are in control. No matter what I do, if I go over there and I want to help Everett out, if he's looking sad, I cannot open his head up and rearrange mm -hmm. stuff and put it back and say, there you go. I uh, can't do it. You can't do it. About whether we have a, 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 luring, a luring internally or an uplifting internally. It's a combination. It's an uplifting, a decision. It's okay. Thought, intention, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Intention toward action. Yep. And you take action one of six yep. ways, right? Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. Mm -hmm. And you yes. take action. And in depression, a lot of it has to do with taking action in your mind, mm. especially, you know, it's a crazy thing about depressive disorders. And you've gone, if you, you've gone out of the mainstream and you want to come back and live in mainstream and they're trying to help you. The idea of people who have not been through heavy, heavy depressions or breakdowns to help a person is to put them in a place where they can afford to live by themselves to be independent. They're trying to help you. So what do they do? They build a, a, a housing complex full of people that have depressive disorders to live together and they think they're helping you. And unless you have a job where you can go somewhere where people are not depressed, how are you going to change this to another perspective and decide you're going to be happy? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And I understand the problem because of the, um, what do you call it? Because of the mythological assumption that anybody who ever had a depression is insane. And then we go on, shall we keep going with insanity? I did that with somebody yesterday. She was so upset and she was so down. And when I was finished with her, she was laughing so hard. She didn't know if she could go back to sleep or not, but she did tell me she went back to sleep. But I told her, you're, 
I said, you're not insane. She said, what do, what do you mean? I said, insane. I mean, you read, read the definition. Watch this. I'll show you. You go in here and you go, what is the definition of insane? Okay. And you, have, you look up insane and it's just not right that they did this. I mean, you know, but it wasn't their fault. They didn't know. Um, here you go. Insane. You're mad, disordered, unsound, deranged, demented. And then you get down here, mad, mad as a hatter, raving mad, out of one's mind. There it is. You're out of your mind. Now, let me ask you something. If you've ever been depressed, did you feel like you were out of your mind or stuck in your mind? Because when you have a, a depressive disorder, you are stuck in your mind. And what is it that helped Nick with no arms and legs? Did it help him to sit at home alone and just think? Did he, did he, you know, and cry about what was outside and just fall inside? No. He reached out and he went out. This whole world is sitting here. I told someone who was very old and she was depressed because of mistreatment and stuff where she she was living and everything else. And I said, why don't you get on the phone and find somebody who has nobody to read to them? Go read to somebody who can't read or who went blind. Mm -hmm. You know, why can't you go and, and, um, and play some music for somebody who can't reach the radio anymore? Why can't you do this? Why aren't people doing this? Because when you start reaching out, you reestablish the connection of everybody being one through the whole entire universe. If I mistreat myself, you mistreat everyone in the system. And if you mistreat someone else, they feel it in the whole system eventually too. This is not this theory. This is coming back to the trees that are in Canada. And the woman who figured out that the reason that the lumber is getting weaker, the pine wood that you buy at the home, you know, Home Depot and stuff, why is it not good wood anymore? Well, it's because the trees that you're growing in organized plots, you know, in a row to replace what you, you cut down before, you made a big mistake. And what was the mistake? You cut the grandmother tree down. And why is that such a big mistake? Because the grandmother tree had roots that went down. And you know those little tiny roots that came off those that can, the tiny roots that came off those and the tiny roots that came off those. Do you realize those roots from that grandmother tree used to hold on to those baby roots of the trees that were growing? Uh-huh. This is not, this is Avatar, the movie for real. <laughs> okay, this is for real. And they found out it's true. Those tiny little roots were making the lumber in the pine and oaks strong, clean, clear wood. Now, now it's no good anymore. You can go to the depot and you can look at the pine that's being delivered in two by fours. And it's hard for you to see a piece of wood like this and look at it, look at this piece of wood and see that it's straight because it's curved and twisted. Why? because grandma wasn't there anymore. <laughs> That's why grandma was not there anymore. They cut grandma down. You see, they made a big mistake. And anything that we grow in the United States that we're growing in a plantation system of pine is no good anymore con compared to the grain of pine wood that was in colonial times hasn't got a prayer. Mm -hmm. It's a sense mm -hmm. true with the wood. See, so we're all working together. So you want to you want to change? My gosh, take a hold of this and change it. <laughs> change it. Why not change it? Change your mind, and you change your life. You change your mind. You shift your mind. I'm not going to take anything personal anymore. And every time I think of something that is down on me, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Let it go. And don't make it so complicated. And start laughing about it.